Tokyo Electric Power Company officials have restarted most of a water decontamination system at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant after a six-day suspension. They halted the system after finding that the performance of one of the lines had dropped sharply. Crews reactivated two of the three lines that make up the Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, on Monday. Previously, untreated water became mixed with treated water in pipes and storage tanks, and the plant operator had to stop all the lines to remove the contaminated water. They say the line in question apparently began to malfunction after workers replaced filters that separate metals from the water in early March. The cause of the trouble remains unknown and the faulty line remains shut off. Alps is said to be able to remove almost all types of radioactive materials from wastewater. It's considered the key to dealing with the massive volume of contaminated water at the plant. Officials hope to have the system in full operation as early as next month. The ALP system has been hit by a series of problems, and the latest may cause a delay in the water decontamination schedule. Workers at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant were hoping to have a water treatment system back up and running. They restarted it on Monday. But several hours later, they had to shut it down. The ALP system is said to be capable of removing almost all radioactive substances from wastewater. Experts believe it will play a crucial role in dealing with the contaminated water building up at the plant. But workers found one of the lines was performing poorly. And untreated water was getting mixed with treated water in pipes and storage tanks. So they suspended the operation for six days. Tokyo Electric Power Company found that the filter that removes salt was malfunctioning. Workers restarted two of the three outs lines on Monday. But then they found water leaking from a storage tank and decided to shut it down again. TEPCO officials say water did not get out of the building that houses the system. They're hoping to put the system into full operation as early as next month. Members of one of Fukushima Prefecture's largest fisheries cooperatives say they'll support a plan to release groundwater from near the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant into the sea. Officials from the government and Tokyo Electric Power Company are trying to prevent water building up inside the crippled plant. Leaders of the Soma Futaba Cooperative say they're concerned about the safety of the plant, but they agreed that urgent action is necessary to prevent any more leaks. The authorities want to pump up groundwater and release it before it mixes with contaminated water used to cool melted nuclear fuel. Members of Fukushima's other main cooperative have already approved the plan. Fishermen in northeastern Japan saw their boats and livelihoods smashed by the tsunami three years ago. They're working hard to rebuild their industry, but not all in the same way. Some are breaking with tradition by fishing for private companies. NHK World's Akiko Okamoto has the story. Momonoda is a small fishing village that's known for high-quality oysters. Katsuyuki Oyama spent decades running an oyster farm there. But the 2011 tsunami washed away everything. The farm, his boat, his home. All of us fishermen thought about giving up our work. Oyama was eligible for government subsidies but he still needed more than $100,000 to relaunch his business. He couldn't take on the debt. Like most of the fishermen in Momonoda, he was in his 60s and didn't have a successor. So government officials created a scheme to help them get back on the water. They set up a special fishery zone, granting fishing rights to private companies. Firms can fish without a fee and sell their products directly to retailers. Oyama and 14 other fishermen teamed up with a wholesaler in 2012 to create a company. The wholesaler put up investment money. The fishermen used the funds to buy boats and other equipment for the company instead of taking on personal loans. They now have set working hours and draw monthly salaries. 
We wanted to take a whole new approach to rebuilding our industry, and we thought this special fishery zone would help revitalize our village. They're also injecting new life into the aging fishery. They hired two men in their early 40s. I've always wanted to be a fisherman. There's no other place in Japan where we can earn a steady income. This company is a dream come true for me. The firm is currently using the wholesalers network to sell oysters to restaurants and supermarkets nationwide. But some strongly oppose the new company's fishing rights that was granted by the local governor. Traditionally, fishing rights have been allocated to local fisheries cooperatives. The fishermen pay a fee to the co-op, and the co-op buys and sells what they catch. Representatives of the co-op that includes Momonoda say they're trying to sustainably manage marine resources. They argue giving fishing rights to private firms will hurt their efforts. <laughs> If we can't control what's being caught, we can't properly manage the fishing grounds and the fish that live in them. But Katsuyuki Oyama argues the special fishery zone is crucial to rebuilding and diversifying the oyster trade. We need fishing rights so we can obtain a large enough area to produce the type of oysters consumers want. This is only possible because we are now a private company. Oyama and his colleagues also plan to sell their oysters overseas. They're prepared to work against the opposition. They consider their firm a new business model that will play a part in reviving the Japanese fishing industry. Akiko Komodo, NHK World, Momonoda. Crews working a giant conveyor belt have begun carrying soil in a northeastern city in Japan struck by the March 2011 disaster. They are bringing huge piles of dirt into residential districts. The conveyor belt was set up in Rikuzen Takata, Iwate Prefecture to promote restoration work in the center of the city. A large suspension bridge was built across a river for the piece of machinery. People in the community have now dubbed it as the Bridge of Hope. The conveyor belt transports soil at a considerably high speed from a nearby mountain. They will use it to raise the ground level of the city center by up to 11 meters. The new community will be rebuilt on it. The belt will span three kilometers by the end of July. It's my desire the Bridge of Hope becomes a symbol of the city and that it will speed up restoration as soon as possible. I'm happy to see progress towards rebuilding, but I also have mixed feelings as I look at the landscape, which will be totally changing. Officials say the amount of dirt needed to fill the region would take trucks a decade to transport, but the conveyor belt can carry 4,000 truckloads of soil per day. They say the work will be shortened to two years by the system. Similar landfill projects are being planned at 31 locations in the tsunami-stricken prefectures. However, due to the cost, the conveyor belts are to be used in only two cities, including Rikuzen and Takata. Government officials are trying to find ways to deal with the nation's aging population and low birth rate. Members of a government panel will also discuss accepting more immigrants to try to solve these problems. Analysts at a national research institute say Japan's population could fall 
by 40 million to just about 87 million by the year 2060. Government officials worry that could shrink the country's economy. They've set up a committee under the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy to look into these issues. A key item on the agenda will be raising the nation's birth rate. Japanese women give birth to an average 1.41 children during their lifetime. Economists at the Cabinet Office predict that even if the birth rate rises to about 2.0 by the year 2030, that wouldn't be enough to put the brakes on Japan's population decline. They predict that the number of working age people aged between 15 and 64 will likely drop severely. Members of the government committee plan to study the experience of other countries that have used immigration to try to deal with shrinking labor forces. Attractions in Japanese zoos are dying of old age and it's getting harder to find replacements from abroad. So some zoos are taking innovative measures to survive. Why is there no elephant? For more than 30 years, the elephant Hanako brought joy to both children and adults at this zoo in Fukuoka Prefecture. Then, last autumn, she passed away. She was everybody's favorite. Her enclosure has stayed empty. When rare animals die in zoos, replacing them is increasingly difficult. For example, a new giraffe costs about 200,000 U.S. dollars. It's not easy to source animals, and the cost is incredible. We would never have imagined this situation 30 or 40 years ago. There's even a chance we won't be able to keep unusual animals anymore. In the past, whenever a zoo animal died, traders who specialized in the import of wild animals could quickly replace it. But the Washington Convention of 1980 virtually abolished the international trade in rare species. One option is for zoos to undertake breeding programs. But many are not equipped to do this. So, some zoos are now joining forces to overcome the problem. Ishikawa Zoo is located in central Japan. In the summer of 2010, it lost its hippopotamus. Deko was Japan's oldest hippo. The keepers searched the world for her replacement. They turned up a surprising offer from Singapore. The Singapore Zoo was willing to give Ishikawa one of its hippos in exchange for a Japanese animal. They wanted a tanuki, or raccoon dog. It's a very common animal in Japan. Some would even call it a pest. The tanuki can thrive through Japan's freezing winters. It's an unusual animal in warmer parts of the world. That makes it a novelty in Singapore, where the climate is tropical. But Ishikawa had a problem. It didn't have any tanuki. Staff searched their network and found a zoo in Toyama Prefecture that could help. With the Toyama tanuki to the rescue, Ishikawa could acquire a pygmy hippopotamus from Singapore. It's one of the world's three rarest species. The deal was also welcomed by the Toyama Municipal Family Park Zoo. It's encouraging to see this was possible. We can maintain our zoos by exchanging our own animals with those in other parts of the world. Who knows, in the future we might even exchange a tanuki for a panda. So if you ever visit the hippo at Ishikawa or the tanuki in Singapore, spare a thought for the spirit of cooperation that brought them there.